Thank you, Alan. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here. Glad you're all here. My name's Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and a member of this group. Tonight, we're going to finish up the chapter, How It Works. We worked through the beginning of this chapter. We talked a lot about step three. Then we moved into step four, and we talked a lot about our resentments and how to write the form. There's a form on page 65 that Bill used that writes that that lists our resentments. So we had our resentment and we learned how to do the sick man prayer and pray for those people that we had resentments against. And that would help us get rid of them and be able to move forward in our recovery. Um, and then we started talking about fears. And uh, if you go to the website, to the downloads page, I have a, a step four worksheet on there you can download. And it has a list of all the fears and all the people we can have resentments against and also some pages you can write down all your list on. It comes in pretty handy. And there's a lot of things we can be afraid of. And so the first thing we do is make a list and we write, we think of all the ways that we're afraid and how fear has something to do with us. It's quite eye opening. And fears are bad. Fears are, fear is the godfather of selfishness, dishonesty, and resentment. And then we have fear and, and selfishness, dishonesty, and resentment do the killing, do the attacks, and fear gives the orders. And it, it said in the book, it seems uh, to cause more trouble than stealing. So we're going to start on page 68. I'm going to reread the last paragraph we read last week. It's the very top paragraph on the page. And it says, we reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. So there's going to be stuff on your fears list that's not on your resentment list. And our fears can be fears that are not connected to other people, places, things, institutions, or principles. Just fears. We ask ourselves, why did we have them? Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us once had great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. So fear dominated us in our drinking careers. We have to get rid of that fear. So in the next paragraph, it's, it tells us, says perhaps there is a better way. We think so. But we are now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role he assigns. Just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us and humbly rely on him, does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? If we want to straighten out that calamity that goes around with us, that, that constantly is disrupting us all the time, if we want to straighten out that calamity, and gain serenity, we need to trust and rely upon our higher power. And it's something we have to work on every day. It's something that we have to get a grasp of inside of ourselves, that dependence and reliance on, on God. And it's hard because we came from a place where we never did that before. So now we're doing that. So it's, it's more difficult. And we have to work on it. It doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come easily. It takes quite a bit of effort. And then it continues and it says, we never apologize to anyone for depending upon our creator. We can laugh at those who think spirituality is a way of weakness. Paradoxically, it is a way of strength. The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. They never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention 
to what he would have us be. At once we commence to outgrow fear. Fear is there. It's in our lives. It, it permeates our whole bodies. And so how do we get rid of that? Well, we don't deal with the fear. What we do is build faith in our higher power. And the more faith you have in your higher power, the more courage you will have. Faith produces courage. It says all men of faith have courage. So the more faith you have, the more courage you have. Now, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is just the ability to face our fears. And that faith builds up and that, that courage allows us to face our fears. And as we face them successfully, the fear diminishes. There is, you know, it's the same thing as you're walking into a dark room and you want to be able to see. Well, you don't do anything to the darkness. You don't go try to bag it up and put it in trash bags and carry it out into another room. You can't do anything to the darkness. What you can do is apply light, bring light into the room, and all the darkness goes away. So if we want to get rid of our fears, the way to do that is to bring faith in. And the more faith we have, the less fear we have, just the same as the more light we have, the less darkness we have. So we bring faith, and that faith gives us courage. It doesn't mean we're going to be comfortable when we face something that causes fear for us. It just means that we're going to have faith and depend on our higher power. What is? How do we do that? How do, how do we accomplish that building of faith? We pray. We pray about it. That last sentence, next to the last sentence, says... We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. And what he wants us to be is courageous and fearless. So we build the faith in him. We get the courage. And when we have the courage, we face our fears and our fears diminish until we outgrow them. But it's the same process of outgrowing. It takes a while. It's not going to happen Tonight, if you pray about getting rid of your fears, it's, you're, it's not going to get rid of your fears like that. It takes constant working and having God with you when you have to face a fearful situation. So if you're going to face something that makes you nervous, makes you uncomfortable, makes you afraid, pray about it. Pray about it before you do it. And then you'll be able to face it. You'll have that faith. And... When there's no fear around and you're not afraid of anything and you're perfectly comfortable in your own skin, when you pray, ask for faith. Build your faith. Build a big pile of faith so that when you need it, it's there for you. Then the courage will be there for you to face whatever you have to face. It'll be there, especially when you're going to do some, some amends in step nine that are a little scary. If you do three and four, you take care of your resentments and you take care of your fears, it'll be a much better event when you go and have your amends in step nine. Keep working on your fears by building faith. So that's our list. That's our next list is our fears list. And now, now about sex. The funny thing is when I came into AA, fourth edition hadn't been printed yet and we had the third edition and that line now about sex was the first three words on page 69 and that was a big joke around AA back then wonder why they put that on page 69 so when they reprinted the book changed a little bit of the big you know the start of the book um you know in typesetting not in changing any of the words little bit bigger margins here and there. It ended up squeezing that first six lines from page 69 over to page 68. So it was a tight setting thing that caused it to change. So, so this is our next list, is our sex list. And it takes a lot of work and a lot of thinking and a lot of getting rid of misconceptions 
Yes, it's about sex. It's about having sex. It's about who we have sex with. It's about how we have sex. But it's also about using sex or sexuality as a tool, as a weapon sometimes. So we have to look at a broad view of sex. This is not just a narrow path. This is a big deal. So it says, now about sex. Many of us needed an overhauling there. But above all, we tried to be sensible on this question. It's so easy to get way off the track. Here we find human opinions running to extremes, absurd extremes, perhaps. One set of voices cry for cry that sex is a lust of a lower nature, a base necessity of procreation. Then we have the voices who cry for sex and more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage, who think that most of the troubles of the race are traceable to sex causes. They think we do not have enough of it or it isn't the right kind. They see its significance everywhere. One school would allow man no flavor for his fare, and the other would have us all on a straight pepper diet. We want to stay out of this controversy. We do not want to be the arbiter of anyone's sex conduct. We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? So here's the big gamut of, you know, just a big array of all the kinds of sex problems we have. Some people don't want to know nothing about it. In the dark, covers up over their heads, you know, and wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, it's over. Other people just want to have sex all the time. And, and that's a variety from as crazy, wild as you think to as prudish as you think with no sex at all or very little. So it's a big topic and everybody coming into AA is coming from all different kinds of cultures and directions and neighborhoods and attitudes and social groups. And so this is a giant topic and it's incredibly varied and it's almost impossible to even think about. But New people coming in need to think about it and, and work on it. And all of us who've been here a while also have to work on it. So it says, we reviewed our conduct over the years past. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Well, selfish, we, we know a lot about. Dishonest. You know, we're alcoholics, we're dishonest. So there was all, we, those are easy. But the next line is, where were we inconsiderate? Remember back when we were looking at the uh, four-step worksheet and I said, the book has three columns in it. And, you know, my sponsor and Joe and Charlie and a couple other people that I know added a fourth column to that sheet. And it's and this column is where was I inconsiderate? And it's a big topic. And we don't it in being inconsiderate is one of those things we do and don't think about it. We don't even think that about it at all. We don't see it. We don't realize it. We, we don't know we're doing it. it. It's something we have to search for is where are we inconsiderate? You know, do we even do we? include people in things or do we do we just not care like what they think so therefore we say things that, that bother them and we don't even care if it bothers them. it doesn't it doesn't matter to us if it bothers them or not that's being inconsiderate you know it's like opening a door walking in a building and a woman is walking behind you or another person is walking behind you and you throw the door open walk in and don't even hold the door for them that's just being inconsiderate to that person if someone is sleeping in your house and you turn up the music really loud, that's inconsiderate. That's inconsiderate of that person that's sleeping. But we do it anyway. We want to hear the music, so we turn it up. It doesn't matter that somebody else is sleeping. You know, we're inconsiderate about timing. 
get up, at, you know, whatever, wherever you are, you, you, you get up and leave from work and you leave your desk early. And it's inconsiderate to those people that then get caught and have to stay longer or whatever. You know, we're inconsiderate to people often without realizing it. And that causes them to get their feathers ruffled. Right, wrong, or otherwise, they get their feathers ruffled, and then we end up paying for it. Remember last time we talked about the chain, the train of circumstances, one circumstance after another circumstance after another circumstance that suddenly brings us misfortune we didn't think we deserved. Well, when we're inconsiderate to people over and over and over again, they strike out. They eventually retaliate. And when they retaliate, we go, what did I do? And we think we're being unjustly, we don't deserve to, but but didn't we start the ball rolling by just being inconsiderate of other people's feelings? So we have to, we have to think about that in all our actions. So you put down on all your lists, put that, where was I inconsiderate? and search for the ways that you were inconsiderate because a lot of those problems that were mentioned in the resentment list, maybe the reason Mr. Brown did some of the stuff he did and maybe why Mrs. Jones snubbed him was because he had also been inconsiderate of her, didn't care about her situation or her position or her feelings at all. And then so she she says, well, to hell with you. I'm not going to even talk to you anymore. And she snubs him. And he goes, why are you snubbing me? Well, because he did something. Being inconsiderate is something that we really have to work hard on. And then it goes on to say, so where have we been selfish, dishonest, and inconsiderate? Then he goes, whom had we hurt? So how did our behavior and our thinking about sex hurt other people. Sometimes we don't think so, but we do hurt other people. So how did we hurt other people? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? And that can be done by if you, you seemingly flirt around your friend's girlfriend, that'll make that guy jealous. So are we doing that intentionally and using that to cause him grief? Are we even aware that we're doing it? Do we say, oh, yeah, I saw a car just like your wife's car parked down at the bar last night. I mean, are you trying to get start trouble at home when somebody else is home? If you say things like that that are not true or not justified or not confirmed and you're spreading rumors, that can hurt other people. So you have to be careful about that. Says, where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? So now we have to look back at what we did and what could we have done that would have been different that wouldn't have caused the problem. Did we just do what we wanted to do and then the problem comes up and we go, what was I supposed to do? Well, now you ask, what were you supposed to do? Think about what you could have done that would have been different that wouldn't have caused the problem. We got this all down on paper and looked at it. Again, a list. All these things need to be written in a list. When it's all jumbled up in your head and you're thinking about it and trying to organize it and categorize it and think about it in your head, it just, it's, you can't make hide nor hair of it. Put it down on paper and look at it objectively. As if it was somebody else's list. Oh, yeah, that guy, he could have done this or he could have done that. But it's you. You could have done something different. So put it on paper and look at it. Study it. Find out what it's about. That's your list. And now what do we do? Well, in this way, we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. We subjected each relation to this test, was it selfish or not? So when you have this list of all these people, first question you ask is, was I selfish in this relationship? And it's not necessarily the relationship with the opposite sex. 
It could be the relationship that you have that's with somebody that affected their life as well as yours. Was it selfish or not? And how do we figure that out? Again, prayer. We ask God to mold our ideals and help us live up to them. Here's two instances on two pages where it says, we ask God. If you look through this book, you will find that line, those three words, we ask God, we ask him with a capital H. You'll find that all over. When you see that, that means pray. When you're asking God for something, you're praying. So every time you see that in the book, you have to pray. It's telling you to pray. It's telling you that the method to use to figure out whether it was selfish or not in some relationship is you pray and you ask God to show you. And that's, again, going back to our fears of we ask God to help take away our fears by giving us faith. And that faith gives us courage. Again, we have to pray. And we have to pray here too. And remember to pray. That's the hardest thing to do is to remember to pray. Praying is easy. Remembering to pray at the right time is hard. And you have to get that in. You have to make prayer a tool you use as you go through your day. When you get into situations, when you're confronted with something, when you bump into something, Pray about it before you do anything about it. First thing you do is pray about it. When you have a resentment against somebody, what do we do? We pray that they that they get everything that we want, and that way we get rid of our resentment. We ask God to help us forgive them, each and every one. That's what we learned on the resentment part of this first step. And the sexual part, you do the same thing. Ask God to help you. We were never able to straighten any of these things out on our own. We come into AA, we get sober, we ask God to take away our compulsion to drink, and he does it. There's proof enough. If you're sitting in your 30 days, 60 days, 90 days sober, or many years sober, then God took away that desire to drink, that obsession to drink. He did it through your whole life up until you came into AA. You were never able to do that. You come into AA, you find a higher power, and you ask that higher power to remove your obsession to drink, and he does. So now, what about all these other things in our life about getting rid of resentments? Why not ask God to help you get rid of your resentments? Uh, Ask God to help you get rid of your fears. And also, ask God to help you get your ideals on the same plane as his ideals. We're never going to be there. We're never going to get that perfect. Well, we ask God to help us. We remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised or loathed. So middle of the road. And then it goes on to say, whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. So our object here is to set is to try to set ideals for ourselves and move towards those ideals. That takes some work. You know, it's like that volume control, that slider volume control. Zero is you can't hear a damn thing, and 10 will blow your ears off. So you don't want either one of those. So where do you want it? Do you want it dead in the middle? Do you want it a little bit here, a little bit there? What do you think God's ideals are? You put God's ideals on that slider at five, and you're sitting there at seven, you got to move towards five a little bit. So you got to change your ideals. You got to mold your ideals to fit what you think God's ideals would be for you. You know, it's not going to be silent. It's not going to be deafening sound. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. And it's everybody's different. So think about it, work with God, pray, 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 and find out what your ideal should be and how you should relate to other people. Remember, a lot of recovery is about our relations with other people. So the sex relations are no different. It says, 
we must be willing to make amends where we have done harm, provided that we do not bring about still more harm in doing so. Do we do that right now? No. We're in step four here. We're getting ready and moving towards step nine. We're going to take our resentment list and our fears list into our ninth step, eighth step and ninth step and work with our sponsor and try to figure out when should we make this amends? How do we make that amends? And we're going to be working on it. So we're not going to make these amends right now. We're just going to become willing to make the amends. Don't make amends in step four. That's why we have step eight and nine. So, but get ready. Think about it. Know it's coming. Know you're going to be making amends later on. So think about how to do it, when to do it, but don't do it yet. And work with your sponsor. And, of course, in sexual matters, you can't go to your best friend and say, sorry, buddy, but I've been sleeping with your wife. That's not how you do it. Because now you're going to kill that guy and that guy's going to be really upset with his wife and she's going to, you know, you're just going to be causing harm all around. That's not how you do it. It says, in other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem. In meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. So this is not something that we have this list and just throw a blanket over it and say one prayer and go on about our business. This is a real inventory of our sex ideas, habits, ideals, all that kind of stuff. And we have to think about it and we have to work on it. In meditation, prayer and meditation working together. Meditation is listening to God. Prayer is talking to God. When you say a prayer and you sit back and relax and meditate for a few minutes, you're liable to get more answers than if you just pray on the run and never meditate, never listen to God. Listen for what God has to say. So again, we ask God. So there's the third time in two pages where it says we ask God. And prayer and meditation work together, but they're two separate things. So you can pray all you want to. If you never... You ask me for directions on my house. And I said, well, you go and you just turn around and walk away. And you don't listen to what the directions are. You're never going to get there. So you can ask God all you want. But if you don't listen, if you don't meditate on it, if you don't allow it to soak into you, you're not going to get the, you'll be walking away before you get the answers. Put part of your day, put meditation in not just a morning routine, but put it in throughout the day when you're thinking about these things, when you're working on your fourth step and you're working on these individual lists and it says we ask him, if we're asking a question, we want to get an answer. So listen for the answer. Don't just ask a bunch of questions and walk away. Ask a question, listen for the answer. So put the two tools of prayer and meditation together. The right answer will come, the caveat being, if we want it. So we've got to be honest with ourselves. We have to be open-minded to whatever the answers are going to be. And we have to get rid of our old ideas and bring in the new ideas. So we have to be open-minded, willing, and we have to be honest. We have to really want to change. We want to really fix our problems. And it takes some work. This doesn't, there's no magic wand here. God's not going to tap you on the head and clean up all your mess. You've got to do that work yourself. So the right answer will come if you want it. God alone can judge our sex situation. Remember, God's the judge. We're not the judge. We don't get to judge anybody or anything. God is the judge. Counsel with persons is often desirable, but we let God be the final judge. We realize that some people are as fanatical about sex 
as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. So no matter what, the thing that knows more about it than anything else is God. God put us here with a variety. So there's going to be differences. There's going to be both ends of a spectrum. So you have to ask God and rely and depend on God and have faith in God. And it says that over and over in this chapter. So it says, suppose we fall short of a chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean we're going to get drunk? Some people tell us so. But this is only a half truth. It depends on us and on our motives. If we are sorry for what we have done and have the honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we will be forgiven and will have learned our lesson. If we are not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we are quite sure to drink. We are not theorizing. These are facts out of our experience. God is always the judge. we got to always depend and rely on God for those things. And it says two or three times in this, in this chapter, we have to have an honest desire to let God take us to better things. God wants to take us to a better place. He's got everything it ne- we need to get us to a better place. We have to let him do that. We can't fight him. We can't use our own self-will. Our own self-will will get in our way. It's either God's will or our will. And if we're doing our will, God's going to say, okay, I gave you the will. Go ahead and use it any way you want to. But you're going to pay the consequences if it's not the right thing. Self-will is not going to help you here. To sum up about sex, we earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity, and for the strength to do the right thing. That's a lot of praying. And it's done earnestly. Please, if you're in recovery, you're working the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, pray more and more and more. Because that's where the answers are, is in the prayers. And look for the guidance. And it says on each questionable situation, not on all of them at one time, each one, individually. If sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves the harder into helping others. We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the imperious urge when to yield would mean heartache. If we have been thorough about our personal inventory, we have written down a lot. We have listed and analyzed our resentments. We have begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality. We have commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill towards all men, even our enemies. For we look on them as sick people. We have listed the people we have hurt by our conduct and are willing to straighten out the past if we can. But not now, in step nine. In step five, in a few of the other steps, in six and seven, we start to work out those things. In this book, you read again and again that faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We hope you are convinced now that God can remove whatever self-will has blocked you off from him. If you have already made a decision, that's step three, and an inventory of your grosser handicaps, step four, you have made a good beginning. That being so, you have swallowed and digested some big chunks 
of truth about yourself. So you can be more honest with yourself. You can be more willing to fix the things and more open-minded in the way that you do that. Thank you all. Great chapter. I love that chapter. And next week, I'm going to start into action because this is an action program. Thank you all for listening. Back to you, Alan.